Hey, welcome back to Military Aviation History and I want to talk about the Russian Air Force. Now, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the less than spectacular outing it currently has over in the Russian-Ukrainian war, but really a lot of the underlying issues it has are not just originating in this conflict, but are grander and more deep rooted in the Russian Air Force and the Russian Air Industry. And a lot of this, although perhaps in the West we haven't really realized this, has been building up on all of these problems have been building up over the years. So to answer a couple of my questions on that, I've turned to Stanimir Dobrev, who is an independent uh, pro bono analyst. Oh, that's that, 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 there we go, there, there is him. And uh, I asked him a couple of questions. Now, Stanimir has been publishing on this uh, stuff for so a while, and he also, in 2018, wrote uh, quite an important article detailing some of the problems that the Russian armed forces have. So without further ado, let's turn right into the interview. Okay, so to start out, I wanted to sort of ask first a big picture question to put us all on the, on the same page, essentially. And if we look back at the end of the Cold War, the Russian Air Force... And then the sort of the last sort of 10 years where there has been sort of a remodernization period and with the Russian Air Force also becoming, of course, the Aerospace Forces, the VKS. What do you see sort of the, as the most significant developments of, of that past decade? Well, for me, it's really not to do so much with the Air Force. Yes, they've managed to sort of get to a certain point, the SU-57 program, but for me more it's um, how much in procurement they've procured things that they don't quite need in terms of the VKS as a whole. And for me, that is the overemphasis on development, different, development of different variants of uh, air defense weapons and the immense amount of money spent on procurement of those. So that's more shows that the VKS was less able to champion its VVS for, uh, portion and more it was able to um, to be forced into funneling a lot more money into the air defense role. Uh, now, that might be down to the political leadership. That might be also a bit to how well, let's say, certain corporations that are part of the Russian industry, uh, military industry, are capable of uh, sort of marketing their services to the political leadership, but it has had an effect. And I would view it as sort of a, um, upgrading the a tertiary role of the VKS, which is air defense, uh, at the cost of, let's say, reducing what could have been a larger budget for the VVS, which is something you use more often, especially when you have uh, interventions abroad. Yes, it's interesting to showcase that you can move uh, an air, a large air defense system or um, more sophisticated one abroad, but your primary tasks are going to be ones that rely on the VVS portion. And that for me has seen sort of a decline in priority. And as such, uh, they've also seen a decline in the introduction of uh, more modern weapon, more modern weapons as a fully developed weapon systems. We have seen a lot of usage of uh, prototypes in a later stage or reaching maturity being used in combat environments, which is something that other nations use, are less likely to do. But we haven't seen them, let's say, reach the same level of uh, overall, just general production. So a lot of things that we saw in Syria, or a lot of things that are a part of the press releases, um, they can be operated by a few squadrons, maybe a few squadrons combined as a regiment, uh, as is the case with the missiles for the uh, ground attack role for the um, uh, MiG-31s with the upgraded uh, designation K, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but we're not seeing them, let's say, uh, incorporated into the larger VVS. So they have a propensity to use uh, prototypes or late stage prototypes that are about to enter production much earlier, but then the actual full-scale production at an economical rate is slower to come, which as we can see right now in Ukraine is sort of showing up as we are seeing a lot less of the more modern 250 uh, series uh, guided munitions being used because while they were presented in Syria a while back, they were still not in a full-scale production mode, even as early as, uh, as late as I think uh, March this year. 
Okay. So, and one of the things I like to emphasize, of course, on, on my channel is that an Air Force, it's not just about the aircraft, right? It's about the ground crews, the airfields, uh, the command and control, the maintenance, the logistics that is involved, and of course, also the training. Now, where do you see sort of the biggest challenge going forward in equipping the, the VKS or that VVS component, as you've been saying, just, just fixed wing aircraft, right, to actually perform as an Air Force, ignoring or bracketing off pilot training for now, because I have a specific question on that as well. Well, for me, the problem is that uh, sort of the, but it's not just the no, the fixed thing. It's uh, the combination of also the Army um, Air Force. It's also incorporated into the VKS. Yeah. The problem is more that they've not operated at this tempo. Uh, they've been operating at let's say between seventy and one hundred and ten hours uh, flight hours per year on average for the different types of aircraft they're using. And um, they've also had problems just incorporating uh, larger formations and controlling them while they're in the air. They've also had issues just building up the infrastructure for that. So they're still uh, getting a holistic uh, battlefield information system that's going to also automate parts of the air defense and automate target selection. And a lot of the types they're operating aren't capable of using modern data links. You, I've had this uh, argument already with some people that yes, they can use the old school things, but if you're uh, going to operate uh, in an environment where there's someone like, let's say the US Air Force or the British Air Force, uh, there, you want to use more modern uh, data links because otherwise it's trivial to just, the computational uh, burden to break in or uh, go through this is not that great. So they have a problem with that. The other thing that they sort of have a problem is um, one thing that they couldn't quite pick up after the Soviet Union was the Soviet Union had a dedicated aggressor training program and more advanced training, something that you can do only after your pilots fly a certain amount of hours. So before mm -hmm. that, you focus on just basic navigation, then some weapons training. And because Russian pilots do a lot of uh, long range patrols, they also fo uh, use up a lot of time to do that. But uh, what used to be um, in the Soviet Republic of um, Turkmenistan, or, uh, I might be drawing a blank on how that was called within the Soviet Union, uh, there we had the um, Mir Mira 2 uh, um, air base, which was dedicated for that aggressor training. Mm -hmm. And pilots who had more uh, flight hours would go there and have specialized aggressor training. That hasn't happened in the current uh, Mari 2. Excuse me, uh, that's the actual name I have written down. That hasn't happened as much with the uh, modern VVS. It hasn't gotten to the point that it can do that these days. And uh, with flights, they're also flying in smaller formations, something that, let's say, even smaller NATO air forces can make up for that mm -hmm. with uh, multinational trainings where a number of countries gather up. And then you can do more complex operations and complex formations and um, operate multiple types of aircraft. That happens much rarer within the Russian uh, VKS and its VVS component. And in terms of logistics and maintenance, the other thing that still plagues them is that um, Russian engines and the maintenance life cycle hasn't improved that much compared to the Soviet times. So they're still uh, usually at half the lifetime of uh, an engine. So if they're operating at this uh, tempo, they're going to reach that moment where they have to do either a major overhaul or just a replacement of the engines much quicker. And because they've been flying less hours, they could have, they were able to economize the engines. So uh, they didn't have to go into the same uh, maintenance routine at the expected years because they were flying, let's say half as much as, as what was expected. So this is a major issue that's going to hit them as they continue to operate at this tempo. And in general, I think that um, their fighter and fighter bomber types uh, usually have an availability or operational uh, availability rate of closer to 50%, 55, 60, which is lower than what you expect in other air forces. So that would also have an impact if they're trying, if you're trying to compare them like for like, it's not just the same thing. And and talking then a little bit further about pilot training, where, where do you see the issues there? And in terms of Russia being able to not just provide the VKS with a, a, you know, a body of 
well-trained soldiers, uh, pilots who have those flight hours and who can then put aircraft in the sky and, and be effective with them, but also to re recycle essentially pilots and, 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 and bring in substitutes and have that long, long, sort of long dedicated training program. Here, the, the problem is actually huge. And it's not my words saying it, it's sort of Shoigu's, one of his statements in front of the Duma when he was giving a, an annual review was that the Russian Air Force was behind 1,300 pilots. Just flat out, that's, that's his words. Uh, one of the things they tried to do was raise the age of retirement by five years, so it was a stop loss program, but that's the sort of a drastic measure. Uh, beyond that, the reason they hit to that point was that in those sort of blank years, uh, pilot training went down significantly. Significantly, They were down to something like uh, 20, 25 pilots graduating from their academies when it comes to, uh, let's say, planes that are uh, in the fighter role or fighter bomber role, which is a very low number uh, to which, let's say, um, the Syrian operation, if they had much greater casualties, could have been a drain on, a net drain on pilots. Wow, and yeah. when you couple it with, let's say, some of their accidents where uh, resupply planes or transport planes that were going to that base crashed, and you had also ground crew and air crew dying within those crashes. Um, it became an actual problem for them to sustain the pilots. I mean, you just operationally, you might start getting losses uh, just with people uh, crashing or just getting even too old that your stop loss program cannot sustain them because physically they can't handle it. And in that regard, they tried to expedite the process of uh, hire, of getting new pilots. So they put pilots behind uh, the controls much earlier, a year earlier within the training schedule. Um, they tried to drastically expand the number of uh, pilots they had in a cohort. So they were now into the hundreds. Uh, the problem, however, that they hit there was that if you expand the cohorts within, let's say, to 300 to 600, and you lower the number of dropouts, you start hitting the issue with planes. Now, they could make up the earlier stage by purchasing the um, uh, Diamond DA-42-2 uh, light training aircraft. The problem was at the later stage, where they were reliant on all Czech uh, L-49 uh, Albatross, or mm -hmm. yeah, that's the Albatross, and Yak-130s. So out of the two types, they had something like between 140 and 150 for each to operate. The problem was that uh, so uh, the Yak, in their own admission, had a 56% um, availability rate, mm -hmm. and the Albatross had a 58% availability rate. However, that didn't quite fit the school year. So... Uh, while they were available, they were available at the wrong time or they were late from main coming back from maintenance and servicing. And again, um, one of the things they're going to have to deal with if they want to keep up this rate is that soon they're going to just have to replace the albatrosses because they're old aircraft. Yeah. And that combined, I don't think, leads to a pilot core that is as capable as they want it to be but just the shortage is so great that they just have to push in people with less experience and they just don't have the aircraft to train them and the instructors to train them as well. Right, so essentially the, the problem is from both sides, the availability of actually being able to train them, plus then the, of course the numbers to, to replace the, uh, the frontline uh, pilots. Um, you already mentioned operational availability of the aircraft, right? And I'm, I'm wondering, how does it look sort of for, for frontline jets? Are they being prioritized? Are they seeing a better service numbers than the stuff that is being in like in the training schools? And how does it look for some, some enablers that the Russian aerospace forces do have like tankers, although they use them very sparingly? I So for the fighters, they're actually, from what I've seen, not that different from the Yaks and the uh, L-49s. They're closer to that point uh mm. again there's some discrepancies so for instance but this goes in sort of into the navy planes if you see the uh mig 29k mm -hmm. if you compare the 
um, Indian experience operating it, it was quite different. They, they had very low availability rates um, in the teens for uh, the two-seater version. Yeah. Uh, I think, and what we've seen from uh, testimonials from uh, captured pilots uh, in the conflict is uh, planes like uh, the Su-44 and the Su's generally have around 50% mm -hmm. in terms of availability uh, during this uh, operation. Now, that is lower than what we're used to, uh, let's say, NATO navies, that, uh, NATO air forces that are well-funded, although caveats appear mm. depending on the type and how long it's been in operation and which subservice it is. Uh, for the enablers and uh, for the other planes that they need to support uh, the ground forces, uh, for the EO, uh, the availability rates that I've seen discussed by Russian VTA officers are closer to the mid-30 range. And again, it depends on the depends on the uh, who's operating it. So because mm. there's a bit of discrepancy between if it's operated by the VTA, which is a branch of the VKS, or if it's operated by, let's say, it can be operated by the Russian Guard, it can be operated by the Special Squadron 224, which is sort of like uh, subordinated outside of the uh, Ministry of Defense, and it has a higher availability. And because it's uh, the Il 78s are sort of derivatives of this type, they're with similar availability rates. And I think that is one of the things when people ask where the A50s to be uh, mobile command centers, well, that's mm -hmm. where they are. They're, they're not as available as you expect. This modernization program, we've been mainly touching on sort of the, the conventional aircraft that, that the, the Russians are fielding. Um, but of course, I think many people are wondering this as well. There is this modernization program going on. There was a lot of media hype surrounding this as well. Sukhoi 57, you've got Checkmate. Um, what do you think, having looked at these programs, what do you think is considering the, the hype that even in Western countries has been attributed to these platforms, what do you think is most often missed and has to be really stated more often? Well, that uh, Su-57 is still a sort of a work in progress as a program. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're delivering Su-57s, but first of all, they're going to deliver something like closer to three regiments of aircraft and three smaller regiments, not the larger ones that the VKS has. Secondly, this is an aircraft that has been, as it's being delivered right now, is being delivered at a very gradual pace. Um, couple that with just, it's a new type entering service and also some of the prototypes. Yes, they're going to augment uh, initial uh, numbers with some of the prototypes that are being um, repurposed, but um, it's going to have very low impact. And also uh, in the next few years, it's going to have to, take the newly, the already delivered numbers and send them back for re-engineering. Right. So until the end of the full procurement program, and that again, depends on how the future goes because uh, procurement isn't sort of set in stone as cost tries, uh, the Russian industry is going to ask for more money to deliver the numbers it's promised. Mm. But over the next 10 years, that those initial free, uh, regiments will not be fully available to the VKS. Mm -hmm. Only after that point, we can say that they're going to have uh, maybe free uh, regiments available. And at the end of that program, with some extension, they're going to have now sort of a core of aircraft that are of that type. So I don't see it for the foreseeable future as being that major because, again, airframes, new type, and a possible re-engine for the ones currently in service if the money is there. Mm. So that is the long-term prospect. This is not a program that's going to have a significant impact over the next five, seven, maybe 15 years. Again, depending on how it slows down. But for the next three to four years, for certain, it's not going to have uh, that, as, that much a significant impact. Now, if um, the other planes are overused during this operation to the point that it becomes uneconomical to sustain uh, their large numbers, then it can become a bigger percentage and a bigger, uh, it have a bigger role in the VKS, but it's not going to be because the orders are increased. It's just going to be, it's what's left. Okay. And flipping this around now, we've, we've spoken sort of a lot about what is what the problems are, but what would you say at the moment Russia 
might be doing well or where do you see really improvements in 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 terms of where they're structurally improving their force or operationally improving or even technically speaking well uh overall i would say that at least they're um working to address the big issues with when it comes to pilots even if they're untrained mm -hmm. that's something that's happening they're uh also starting to sort of rationalize a bit that certain types shouldn't be retained like mm. they cut the two uh 22 m3 program uh, the upgrade which is the upgrade for that plane is no longer going to be as massive and not as much money is going to be spent on that um that however being and also like uh, i mentioned earlier they are introducing uh, more modern munitions uh, in place of the old caps that were just being pulled out of storage. And I mm. think when people were telling us how expensive they are, they're just telling us how much it cost them to put them in a crate, the price of that crate, and shipping them to Syria. Because for a long time, that was the uh, that was the main guided munition that was being used by mm. the VKS. Uh, they're also investing in more integration between their aircraft, and they're trying to get more modern uh, systems to, let's say, to have the full range of capability that, let's say, a NATO Air Force can have if it's fully funded to support itself in complex operations. They also still have, uh, even though it's not as readily available, a non-trivial uh, sized uh, tanker and transport fleet, even though they have lower availabilities and they're not maybe as capable of doing some things that let's say the VDV wants them to uh, do combat drops with entire brigades or division. It's more like a few battalions and then we'll see. But they still retain that, which is, for example, one of uh, the reasons why, uh, which if we compare it to France is one of the reasons why France had to re retain the services of Volga Dnieper mm -hmm. to support some of its operations, which is something that Russia doesn't quite have to do. I am of the opinion that the VTA is not as stellar as people assume but it has the numbers even at low availability to have, to be a significant transport segment. Okay. And there, there's an observation that was done by another guest um, that I, I previously had uh, on the channel. And he said, uh, basically, before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there, the, in the West, we basically assumed that Russia was maybe not a peer level adversary in terms of the air war, but it, it, it's getting close to what NATO countries can do, right? And that has sort of in the wake of of the of uh, February twenty fourth, uh, twenty twenty two, it appears not to be true, right? And for somebody who has been tracking these issues for a while now, my 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 question is basically: what what is your biggest takeaway from the Russian invasion of Ukraine in terms of the the VKS's performance there? I I think I mentioned it yesterday online. Was it mm. so far the impact of the VKS is comparable to what one squadron squadron from Norway and one squadron from Denmark did in over Libya. Okay. Uh, we're we're down to seeing videos of uh, modern airframes using non-guided missiles and strafing runs. That's that that's not where they should be. We're down to them uh, delivering delivering over this period hundreds to over a thousand strikes. Mm. Uh, they haven't wrestled control of the air. They have trouble even fielding uh, an airframe that will tell them when the Ukrainians are switching on an a, a radar or switching it off to be able to actually hunt Ukrainian air defense, which isn't something that modern, even if the Ukrainians are trying really hard. Uh, they haven't achieved any dominance of the air. Um, they've lost dozens of aircraft against an opponent that is working with even earlier generation tech most of the time. So um, I think that this war has shown that the VKS was sort of the weakest link. Uh, when it comes to um, complete automation and integration systems, they're the ones that are the most behind. Mm. They don't have one. So the other services have one and are integrating them. First was the VDV. The army has one. It's not fully integrated, but it's integrated. The VKS is still in the procurement process and development and design stage in September last year. Right. So, and also they're suffering major delays 
and their procurement was dominated uh, to a degree externally from them, but they couldn't fight it to field a defensive role, which even with the systems that are sort of under their wing, but are usually used by the ground forces to cover core and army, uh, army level assets, those are there to inflict the cost on the attacker trying to hit you. They're mm -hmm. not there to actually take down aircraft. They're there to provide a, a cost-effective virtual attrition. And we're getting to those systems costing more than the assets they're protecting, which is sort of the reversal of how things should be. So overall, I don't think they've performed very well. And some of the issues we've seen is that um, we haven't mentioned it so much on the helicopter side, but some of the, for example, one of the captured Ukrainian pilots was actually convicted by the VKS, uh, not Ukrainian, captured Russian helicopter pilot, was convicted by the v, uh, VKS for lying about how much he flew in 2018 to get a bonus. And he lied that he flew 56 hours. He flew nine. Wow. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay, on that note, I, I think people that have listened to this now, they probably want to know, okay, so where can we find more information about this topic? And, and the, the question that I have, like, what recommendations would you have, preferably if they are exist in English, right? But what recommendations do you have in terms of sources, articles, uh, where people should turn to to find this sort of information? I am sad to say that I don't think all of it exists in English. Usually mm. I go to Russian sources. The usual start-off point is BMPD, who is a live journal poster, who is an aggregator of stories, but he usually aggregates stories that are coming from major publications. Uh, all, in regards to the VKS, you could find a lot of public, a lot of stories in Commerçant, which were tracking up to the point where it became dangerous to comment on uh, the, Russian the Russian military, they were tracking what was happening with the detachment in Syria. And that's how we learned about some of the losses because their correspondents were um, uh, actually contacting service members. Uh, you would also see Izvestia was the one that posted a big expose on what was happening with training. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to crashes and how we learned that the MiG-31's radar wasn't really all that good and they had to keep restarting it. So that's how you got a blue on blue uh, hit that actually came from uh, Baza, uh, a Russian outlet. And from then on, you have to focus on the publications which focus on uh, the military industry. I'll give you a more detailed list you can share with your um, subscribers if you want. Yeah, sure. That, that would be fantastic. Stanimir, thank you very much for, for your overview and for the information. And yeah, thanks for, for being uh, a guest. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much to all the Patreon channel members for making this channel possible. And as always, I wish all of you a great day. Go out there, meet with friends and family and see you in the sky.